Thank you, Scott. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the PARC seminar today. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Naomi Ginsberg from Berkeley. Naomi is a native Canadian and got her bachelor's degree at the University of Toronto, then went to Harvard and got a PhD in physics, and from there went to Berkeley, where she was a postdoc with Graham Fleming in the chemistry department and the Berkeley lab. I guess she must have done okay on her postdoc because they invited her to stay on as a faculty member. Sure. And she's now a, a faculty member in the departments of chemistry and also has an appointment in physics. And so, Naomi, welcome to St. Louis. <laughs> really pleased to have you with me today. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Bob, and thanks, Cynthia, for the invitation as well. <laughs> uh, so, I'll focus my re remarks primarily today on studies that we've recently been doing uh, on uh, the exciton dynamics in individual crystalline domains, uh, which you see right here, uh, in a small molecule organic semiconducting thin film uh, that might have applications, for example, in organic electronics or organic photovoltaics. Okay, and this is one of two major research areas in my group. Uh, it namely falls under the umbrella of imaging ultra-fast processes and solar energy conversion, where at the moment we're primarily inspired by photosynthesis. Uh, we started doing some work characterizing uh, biomimetic life harvesters, uh, and the stuff that I'll talk about today is primarily uh, in, in the realm of thin film photovoltaics. Uh, While well, this side of my lab focuses on how energy moves on ultra-fast time scales through complex materials, uh, the other side of my lab thinks more about how molecules move themselves through complex materials. And we're particularly interested uh, in the long term at looking, for example, at uh, the reorganizations of proteins in photosynthetic membranes. So for that, we really need nanoscale resolution. And so we're building a new sort of microscope uh, that I'll tell you about really briefly at the end of the talk, uh, where we're leveraging the focusing ability of electron microscopy uh, with the non-invasiveness and spectral selectivity of optical microscopy. Okay, so I'll come back to that. Uh, but for now, uh, I came here from San Francisco where uh, perhaps you might not be surprised to find out that even the solar cells have to be organic. Uh, so um, this is a, 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 these are a bunch of organic dye-based solar cells that are sitting on the bus stop here uh, in San Francisco. Um, and these are made of small molecules similar to chlorophyll molecules. Uh, and, and these molecules um, have a lot of redeeming features that make me want to study uh, this sort of uh, material more and find out why it isn't yet as efficient as the very first instance in photosynthesis. Okay, uh, so uh, these molecules uh, are, can make very flexible materials, not only mechanically like you see here, but also in terms of the solar spectrum uh, that they're able to uh, absorb. Uh, they're made of materials that are earth abundant and non-toxic elements and so forth. Uh, but what I find really cool about them is the fact that you can print them like an ink. Okay, so this means that you can uh, manufacture these materials very, uh, uh, in a very cost-effective fashion. Uh, and what my lab is interested in primarily right now is the byproduct of that printing process. The fact that you don't get perfect uh, crystalline films, for example, the fact that they have this polycrystalline nature, and we want to understand how the structure of these materials uh, impacts things like exciton dynamics and exciton migration. Okay, so you've probably, uh oh, let's see, hopefully my slides will continue. Let's see. Okay, so you've probably heard people talk many times about the various stages that are uh, important in terms of converting solar energy into electricity. Um, and they're basically uh, shown right here. Okay, so if you imagine that you have some sort of junction between an electron accepting and an electron uh, donating material, uh, when you create an exciton in the material uh, using light absorption, especially in these organic materials, uh, the, uh, the uh, configurations of the molecules uh, are, are such that uh, the exitons that you create are, have very tight binding energies, which means that they have to uh, migrate, in some cases, rather far in order to get to an interface uh, where charge separation occurs. Uh, and then, of course, you need to be able to collect uh, the electron in the hole at opposite electrodes in order to get a photocurrent or a photovoltage. Um, so as you can see here, the part of this process that I'm most excited about in my lab is this 
what, what happens to the energy during this exiton migration phase. Okay, so um, here it really is the way that the molecules pack together and couple to one another electronically uh, that determines the electronic properties of the material. Uh, and <clears throat> we're interested in understanding how the structure of the material, whether it's perfect or not, uh, might make this arc that you see right here uh, a little bit of an idealization. Okay, so we like to know uh, if excitons are created in these materials and what happens to them. We want to understand all the dynamic processes, whether they're loss mechanisms or whether they're things that uh, could be favorable in terms of increasing the efficiency uh, of devices like this one here. Okay, so in terms of organic uh, photovoltaics, what might you make uh, these sorts of materials out of? Uh, well, um, for this electron accepting material, people generally use fullerenes, and I won't talk about those today. What I want to focus on are studies that we've done uh, on the electron donating material here, um, this molecule, TIPS pentacene, a pentacene derivative uh, that we solution cast in the solid state. Okay, so a TIPS pentacene is a very interesting molecule to us for many reasons. So I wasn't joking when I said that you could capture a lot of the solar spectrum, uh, as you see right here. And this is basically a pentacene backbone uh, with these two bulky side groups right here. And the purpose of these two side groups, I think, is twofold. On the one hand, it allows you to solution process the molecule. You can't dissolve pentacene in many things in order to make films of it, but uh, you can solubilize it with these groups here. Uh, but it also disrupts the typical packing structure that one would obtain with pentacene uh, so that you end up with a sort of brick layer geometry um, when these molecules pack together. Uh, and in this geometry, there's a lot of pi stacking between the molecules, and uh, this enables very high hole mobility, so very high, uh, uh, very high uh, conduction of charges and also very interesting properties for the excitons themselves. Um, another thing that's very important in terms of photovoltaic application is that TIPS pentacene supports singlet fission. Okay, so uh, singlet fission is a very beautiful process whereby if you have uh, a singlet excitation energy that's roughly twice the energy of a triplet, when you create a singlet um, excitation, it can interconvert into a pair of triplet excitations. So this is really important from the perspective of trying to harness as much uh, energy from each uh, photon uh, from the sun as possible because it means that you can get two quanta uh, for the price of one and boost the external quantum efficiency of a solar cell above a hundred percent. Okay, and this is something that's actually been shown in the Baldo group um, fairly recently. Okay, so I'll come back to this process of singlet fission because it's something that we're able to see uh, in the data that we collect in our lab as well. <clears throat> Okay, but what I want to come back to right now specifically is this notion, this byproduct of what happens when we solution cast uh, these sorts of films. Um, so if you, for example, took a picture of the innards of one of the films inside of uh, the panels in this bus stop, uh, this is basically just a steady state transmission image in our microscope. Uh, where we're looking at a film that we've made of this molecule, TIPS pentacene, and you see that there are these different sort of ribbons of color. Each of these really represents a different crystalline domain uh, in the material, okay? Uh, so, for example, in one domain, say over here, uh, you might have a particular packing structure and orientation. Um, and then if you look at some other location in the film, you might find a different uh, packing structure uh, and a different orientation, okay? Uh, so we're interested in understanding how it is that um, these different morphologies and of course the boundaries between them uh, could have impact on the way that excitons are able to migrate in these materials. Um, so if we switch over to maybe more of a cartoon sort of picture, if we wanted to probe, um, you know, what these sorts of differences look like, say we do some optical measurement uh, in this material. Um, if we were to make some measurement over here in one domain, we might have one signature. If we measure in another domain, we might find a different signature. Uh, and then if we measure right here at the boundary between the domains, where again, it's the structure, the packing of these molecules that determines their electronic properties, we might also measure um, a different signature. Now, what's a little bit tricky about this is that most optical measurements that people do on these sorts of materials 
uh, are done with you know, in bulk, okay? So it, with focal volumes that are, say, a few hundred uh, microns across. And when you do that, in a lot of these uh, organic semiconducting films, you're averaging over many different domains, okay? And that's really um, a disadvantage uh, in many cases because if you average over all of those different optical signatures, then you don't get a true mechanistic picture of what's going on in any individual one. So what we do in our lab uh, is we focus our laser beams down so that we can fit them within individual domains uh, and we actually raster through these domains so we can make pictures uh, that represent what happens to the excitons that we generate in these materials. Okay? So each spot uh, where we stop and take a measurement, um, our measurement might look something like this. It's a transient absorption measurement. Uh, so we're in some sense doing transient absorption microscopy. Uh, so let me explain to you um, for the purposes of, for example, analyzing our data, <laughs> what, uh, what I think of is of transient absorption spectroscopy and then show you how we stick this into a microscope. <clears throat> okay, um, so this is really a workhorse of ultra-fast spectroscopy. Um, the general idea is that you send two light pulses into a sample, uh, the pump and the probe. Uh, and the pump's job over here is to create a bunch of these photo excitations in the sample. And then we just look at the transmission of the probe pulse that we can delay with respect to the pump um, at will. <laughs> uh, and uh, we look at this uh, transmission in order to figure out how the pump affects uh, how much light the probe uh, actually transmits. Okay, so we do a differential measurement, meaning uh, we'll measure how much probe light gets through uh, whether we're pumping the sample or not, um, and then that should report in some way on the population dynamics of these excitons uh, in our material. So say I had a really simple electronic structure with a ground state and an excited state. If I pumped um, this transition here, which in our uh, tips pentacene films is around 700 nanometers, uh, and if I probed at the same wavelength, um, then I would always get more light out. Um, when I pump the sample than if I, if I don't, okay? And that's because the probe pulse will either simulate emission from this populated excited state or because I've removed some of the ground state population in order to create these excitations, um, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be less able to excite uh, more uh, excitations in the material. So that's a ground state bleach, okay? Uh, but the upshot of this is that um, my signal that I measure Okay, which is the differential amount of transmission of the probe is going to be maximum uh, when the pump and probe show up at the same time. And then as I increase the time delay between them, uh, the signal generally decays and that's because of processes like internal conversion or um, uh, radiative decay, whatnot. Okay? Um, so this is what happens when you have a really simple electronic structure. It gives us this positive signal. Uh, but say I make the electronic structure just a little bit more complicated and add this other excited state here uh, that happens to be at twice the energy uh, of the first one. In that case, if I use my pump to create a bunch of these excitations here, um, then the probe pulse can actually be absorbed. This is excited state absorption, um, and that means that there's less light that comes out, so this is a negative signature. Okay, so the main thing uh, I really mean to point out with this slide about transient absorption uh, is that we generate both positive and negative signatures uh, in the measurements that we make. Uh, and even though these two transitions here and here um, are both, um, have, both have the same energy, um, this positive and negative behavior that we see is an indicator of how the polarization of our probe light pulse is oriented with respect to various transition dipole moments in the sample. Okay, so we may have very different transition dipole moments here and here. Okay, uh, so we do these transient absorption uh, experiments, but by focusing our pump and our probe through a microscope objective here, <clears throat> and then we're able to uh, make spot sizes on our sample to do these experiments that are about three orders of magnitude smaller uh, than typical sizes that people use in transient absorption experiments and we can fit these spots within individual domains. Okay, uh, so here's an example of what that looks like uh, in these sorts of materials. Uh, so along the bottom, these are steady state transmission images of three different regions of interest in films of this tips pentacene molecule. Um, and what you see along the top is for a fixed time delay between our pump and our probe, uh, 
what we measure for this transient absorption. Um, so you note that there are a lot of similarities. We're able to pick up the sort of general domain structures uh, that you see in the linear measurements, in our nonlinear measurements as well, but there's a lot of other information that's encoded in, uh, in the transient absorption, uh, and I hope you would agree with me that it would be really uh, deleterious to try and average over all of this information, uh, that we'd be washing out a lot of details. Okay, uh, so uh, this really uh, is why we want to be able to uh, build a sort of mechanistic picture uh, of what's going on, what the exciton dynamics really are in these materials. Uh, even though they're only made of a sim single molecule, you can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity. Okay, and in order to build this sort of picture, we need to build some sort of structure function relationship. Uh, so we need to be able to correlate the structure of the materials uh, through the electronic structure uh, to the exciton dynamics. And we're measuring exciton dynamics, then uh, it's our job to try and figure out how to close this feedback loop in order to allow the exciton dynamics to report back on the connection between um, how excitons behave and the structure that they're exploring. Okay, uh, so by substructure right here, uh, what I really mean is what are the shape and size of these domains? Uh, what, um, what sort of orientation do these crystal grains have? How, how pure are they? What's the packing look like? Uh, these are very anisotropic materials. Okay, so in order to get a handle on that, we do a lot of a priori characterization uh, using surface measurements and also a lot of uh, polarized optical measurements. Uh, so that we feel like we have a pretty decent idea of what our samples look like uh, from a structural perspective. And then that puts us in good stead to look at these exciton dynamics where we're trying to encode or decode uh, various processes. So not only things like recombination, whether uh, radiative or non-radiative, but also uh, thermalization processes, the singlet fission uh, that I mentioned to you before, or other particular locations where excitons get trapped. Um, and so this is all uh, subject to the local structure, and so that's why we do our local transient absorption measurements here. And in order to close this feedback loop, we really have to be very careful uh, not to mistake uh, the optical response uh, of, of, of the, the material to our, our probe light pulse that we're using to make our measurement uh, for the exciton dynamics. I'll show you what I mean by that uh, very shortly. Uh, but the upshot is we really don't want to average over these materials. Okay, um, so uh, let me show you some data that these very happy looking people took. Okay, so this is Kathy and Sam and Ben and Rodrigo and Hao, uh, and they've all participated in this project. Um, so this is uh, just a steady state image of one of our films of TIPS pentacene, uh, and Kathy and Ben uh, spent a lot of time analyzing the transient absorption in this region of interest here. Okay, uh, so just to give you an idea of what I mean by uh, the heterogeneity uh, that we observe in the transient absorption uh, signal, um, if I say looked at a particular spot in this film right here, this green spot, uh, with a particular set of light polarization conditions and so forth, um, I measure a transient uh, that looks like this one here. Okay, so this is positive, that means it's a, a ground state bleach. Uh, dominantly. But if I look, uh, say, a little further away at this orange spot right here, um, then at this particular location, I measure something that looks completely different. Okay, I measure something uh, that looks um, negative. Okay, so this means it's dominated by excited state absorption. Uh, and so this is the sort of heterogeneity that we see, and we need to be able to decode what it means. Okay, so I promised you that we can actually you know, do microscopy with these sorts of things. So rather than looking at these traces as a function of time, uh, we can actually uh, look at pictures uh, that look like this. Okay, so this is the transient absorption map that we obtain uh, in this entire region of interest here. Uh, and it's taken with a time delay between the pump and the probe pulses of 50 femtoseconds. Uh, and where we polarize our pump pulse in this sort of uh, diagonal direction here, and this probe pulse uh, in the horizontal direction, which uh, I'll call zero degrees in this case. Okay, so uh, if you wanted to start analyzing this sort of picture, according to our, our scale bar here, uh, the signal that we measure everywhere looks negative, so that's an indicator of strong excited state absorption uh, to some higher lying state, uh, 
Uh, and um, the uh, different colors that you see uh, just tell us that this is the stronger of the two signals. So you can see that this is a very uh, well-defined green boundary uh, between an upper domain here and a lower one. Okay, um, but if I uh, say start stepping the polarization of our probe pulse, look at what happens. Okay, so if I increase um, this angle by 45 degrees, so now the probe is diagonally polarized here, um, then these colors swap. Uh, if I keep on going, um, then this top domain here uh, turns red, so that means now it's dominantly a positive signal. And then if I keep on going, another 45 degrees, uh, these two colors change. Uh, so this shouldn't be too surprising. This is actually a, a periodic variation um, in the polarized response uh, of the material. And this is something that we have a handle on. So again, um, you can think of it as we're varying the angle of the uh, probe light pulse that we're using to do our measurements, but uh, at a particular location in the material, there may be transition dipole moments that are oriented in a particular way. Okay, so it just depends on how uh, our electric field uh, from the light pulse is projected onto those, okay? Uh, and uh, that ends up really helping us a lot to understand the dynamics in these materials. Um, we can also make these sorts of measurements for different time delays that so you can see we get another series of pretty pictures, but to be quantitative in terms of understanding the exciton dynamics, it's actually really helpful uh, to be able to uh, look at time traces at individual locations. Uh, so what I propose to do um, is to show you how much we can learn just by looking at one individual spot here, okay? Get as much information as possible about this one location, and then we'll pan back out and try and explain the dynamics that are going on throughout the entire film, okay? Uh, so this is the transient that I showed you before for this one region, uh, and I want to switch over to plotting um, these time traces uh, on a log scale uh, so that you can see the earlier time dynamics much more clearly. Okay, uh, so on this log time scale here, uh, our transient absorption signal, now you can see very clearly has a, a total of one, two, three uh, different processes uh, that, are, that are going on uh, at different sort of rates in the material, okay? And we wanna figure out what those are, okay? Uh, but a complete data set corresponds to doing this for a whole series of different uh, polarizations, because I showed you we get very different signatures depending on what light polarization we use. Okay, so this is a full data set as a function of time uh, and this light polarization. If you look, for example, along this ridge here, um, that corresponds exactly to um, this trace that you see. Uh, and then if we vary the polarization, uh, you can see that there's this sort of periodic dependence if you look on the edge uh, right here. Okay, so that's what I was saying, we understand uh, uh, why there's that sort of variation. We need to decode it is all. Okay, so Kathy and Ben uh, worked really hard in order to collect all of this data. Um, remember that they're measuring in a spot that's you know about a thousand times smaller than what people typically measure and they got this nice consistent data set to analyze. Uh, but when Kathy started analyzing it, um, she did so by looking at transients that look like these because, again, it's easier to be a bit more quantitative with those. So let me um, extract from this data set uh, some different traces to look at, okay? Uh, so here's one of them. And at this particular uh, light polarization that was used, it looks kind of like a check mark, okay? So it's pretty negative, uh, but you can see there are one, two, three different um, sort of segments uh, to the curve. And if I start stepping the polarization of the light in this case, um, then it becomes more negative, uh, then it becomes a little bit less negative, okay, then the signal gets smaller. Um, then if I keep on going, it actually crosses uh, over and it becomes positive, okay, uh, and then it also uh, gets a little bit closer to zero. So this is again this sort of periodic variation um, in the signal that we measure, uh, but I want to emphasize that the, the exciton dynamics at this one location right here in this film are the, the same, irrespective of what light polarization we use to make our measurement in the end. So these curves all encode the same dynamics. Um, it's really just a question of, of how we choose to probe. Uh, and, and this is exactly the reason why we have to be careful to decode this optical response from uh, the exciton dynamics themselves. 
And this is something that we're only able to see uh, because of the fact that uh, we're focusing on a small homogeneous region uh, within one of these films. Okay, uh, so having all of these traces allows us to do some pattern matching. Uh, so one pattern that we see is that we can fit all of these different traces to um, tri-exponentials, okay? Uh, so the three different exponential components um, and they have very different time scales. So I hope that this shows up. Let me see. Is this, let's see. There, okay. Um, so you can see them in these uh, three different regions here where there's some different sort of thing that's happening um, in, in the dynamics in all cases, okay? Uh, and we want to be able to figure out what the patterns are. Uh, so if you look on the left-hand side in this bluish region, um, what you'll note is that all of the traces drop, okay? They start at a higher, higher value and get lower, whether um, they happen to be positive or negative. And then in this middle value, uh, sorry, this middle region, it's the opposite that happens, everything rises. And then um, in this uh, longer time scale region here, everything just shrinks. Okay, so there are these trends and these trends are really helpful. Um, they allow us to tell the difference between whether we just have um, decay of an excited state population, so returning to a ground state, uh, or uh, an excited state population transfer. Okay, um, so that's really handy to us and something we wouldn't be able to see uh, unless we had all of these traces. Um, and uh, if we averaged all of these traces together to get an idea for what it would look like if we did a bulk measurement, uh, we would get a trace that looks like this one that you see right here in gray, okay? Uh, so then we wouldn't have access to all of that information. Okay, so what I'd like to be able to do uh, is tell you what we believe uh, each of these three timescale processes uh, means uh, in this material. Uh, and I'll, I, I'll go through the sleuthing, I guess, um, uh, retrospectively <laughs> and a little bit faster than doing it in real time. Okay, so uh, I'll start on the right and move our way uh, to the left. Um, this process here uh, that has around a few hundred uh, picosecond time scale of decay uh, is uh, a, a process where excited state uh, population of ectotons is just um, disappearing, period. Okay, so this is recombination, whether radiative or non-radiative. Uh, in this particular situation. And one way to see this using a sort of cartoon picture um, is as follows. If you imagine that um, these are the two different states um, that are important in this case, the ground state and a singlet excited state. Uh, so you've populated the singlet excited state and uh, there's some corresponding number of vacancies in the ground state. Uh, and after a few hundred picoseconds, uh, both of those uh, decrease in size. Okay, so if I were to go and probe um, this material uh, at these two different instants in time, um, in this case here, uh, before this relaxation process, I might have a particular strength of excited state absorption and a particular strength of ground state bleach, uh, and both of those strengths are going to decrease um, as a function of time uh, because these uh, two populations decrease as well. Okay, so this is um, a fairly common case. Um, you know, no excitation lives forever, uh, but um, I think it's really nice to be able to illustrate in terms of this picture so that we can then look at uh, some more complex processes uh, that occur at shorter times. Okay, uh, so if we move on, for example, to look at this intermediate time scale uh, where we see a three picosecond increase in uh, uh, our traces for all of the different polarizations. This tells us that there's population transfer from one state uh, to another excited state. Uh, and we believe that this is a signature of singlet fission uh, that I mentioned earlier. Okay, uh, so singlet fission again is this process where if you have uh, singlet excitations, they can interconvert into these correlated pairs of triplet excitations that have half the energy, so that the pair of them together has roughly the same energy as the singlet. Okay, so this is something that we think is happening on this sort of three picosecond time scale where there's some interconversion um, to this doubly occupied triplet state. Um, but because you started with one exciton and you ended up with two, um, the number of vacancies that you have uh, in the ground state actually increases because you have two whole quanta. Each quanta um, involves you know, an electron and a hole. Okay. Um, so this comes in really handy in our analysis because now if we uh, probe the system 
uh, at an earlier time, we might have these particular strengths for excited state absorption and ground state bleach. Uh, but then uh, if we probe at later times, uh, this is what we think we see. So a stronger bleach because we have more vacancies here uh, and because the singlet population has decreased and we're not resonant with any transitions with these triplet states, um, this uh, negative signature here also decreases. Okay, so the negative stuff gets smaller and the positive stuff gets larger. And that means that regardless of which way you think about it, uh, our signal going from here to here should increase, which is exactly what we see uh, at all uh, of these different light polarizations. Okay, now this could be other things. It could, for example, uh, be that we're seeing trapping of excitons at, at various sites, uh, but we don't think that's the dominant process that's going on here. Um, because when we build a kinetic model in order to explain these measurements, um, it works much better when we have a reversibility uh, so that these uh, pairs of triplets can actually convert back to singlet states. Okay, uh, so if we go through the same sort of process looking at this very fast time scale of about 50 femtoseconds, which we can resolve in our measurements, uh, where we see uh, a sharp decrease in our signal at all different light polarizations, uh, this is, again, an indicator of population transfer from one excited state to another. Uh, and here we think that this is just a thermalization process. So we're um, exciting to some hot singlet state, uh, and then we have vibrational relaxation. Okay, so in that case, uh, again, if we go through the same sort of exercise, um, we, we find trends where the excited state absorption uh, will increase as this uh, 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 relaxed population grows in. Uh, and where um, the stimulated emission uh, from this hot state will actually decrease. So that's why we think that we're seeing uh, this thermalization at this very short time scale. Now this could have been other things too. Um, it could have been something nonlinear, like higher order nonlinearities, like singlet annihilation, which is something that we were able to rule out um, using uh, power dependence. Um, and also there have been reports recently in these organic semiconducting materials uh, of uh, spontaneous charge separation just by, in the bulk, just by um, illuminating uh, the materials. But we don't think that uh, we see that either, uh, and we can make some polarization-based arguments about the transition dipole moments of free carriers uh, in order to rule that out. Okay. Uh, so I don't want to uh, go uh, into too much detail about all those other possibilities. We can discuss them later if you'd like. Uh, but based on that analysis, it was uh, enough to give us a really nice four-state model, okay, the simplest possible model um, that we could uh, use in order to describe our data. Okay, so we have this ground singlet state, this hot uh, excited singlet state, this relaxed one, and then this uh, doubly occupied triplet state. And they're coupled with various processes. Uh, and when Sam went to model this data, he also had to um, uh, build in the optical response of our light pulses uh, by folding in these transition dipole moments uh, for these various transitions here. Okay, so Sam took all this information uh, and he um, did a simultaneous fit to all of our polarizations uh, at which we measure uh, the transient absorption in these materials and you can see he did a pretty good job. So we were very pleased with this. Uh, it made us feel that uh, we were really capturing all of the dynamics um, in this simple model uh, and that the polarizations helped us to constrain uh, our measurements. Um, but everything that I've told you so far is about this one particular spot right here, okay? And I promised that we would kind of back out uh, and look at the entire region um, that we first observed. Um, so the first thing we decided to do uh, in order to try and back out was to um, say, well, maybe the same model should fit in all different locations. We just have to be a little bit careful about how we apply it. Okay, so let's take the same model and try and simultaneously fit the data first at both this green point and this orange point here. Okay, um, so that's what Sam did with Rodrigo's help. Um, and you can see that, again, um, these fits are quite nice uh, in both cases, this for the green spot and this for the orange spot. Uh, and it turns out that the fit parameters end up being fairly similar, so the rate constants are fairly similar uh, in the two different locations. What's different is uh, that there's a sort of phase offset in the, this periodic polarization dependence 
um, that I that I mentioned before. Okay, uh, and this basically tells us that the structures, uh, if these two different crystal grains are fairly similar to one another, uh, but their orientations are different. Okay, so I think it's really beautiful uh, that we were able to do this in the sense that if I try and make a measurement for any given set of conditions, uh, what I see uh, ends up looking kind of unreconcilable. So for example, this blue trace and this blue trace. Um, but I can use this model in order to unify what we've seen and to show when uh, the dynamics themselves uh, are indeed similar. Okay, so um, that's really uh, a story about what happens uh, in homogeneous regions within individual domains. We're also interested in boundaries, which uh, we've just started exploring. Uh, so very briefly, here's another one of these uh, films of tips pentacene that Kathy looked at. Uh, and she looked specifically at uh, a spot in this top domain and another spot uh, in this adjacent domain, uh, but also um, at this spot um, right at the boundary. Okay? Uh, and she did this for a series of different light polarizations. And I want to draw your attention specifically uh, to what happens at this polarization that we're calling 160 degrees. Uh, so at 160 degrees, um, what you'll notice is that um, the blue trace from the top domain and the green trace from the adjacent domain are both dominantly positive, okay? But what we measure at the boundary uh, is negative, okay? So we don't think there's any way um, that we can um, use the two signals that we measure above and below the boundary to completely model what's going on at the boundary, okay? So that's really exciting. We need to do a lot more work to be able to pinpoint what's going on. Uh, we have started doing some of that. Um, we don't know what these boundaries look like in reality. We've started worrying a little bit about impurity concentrations, and that doesn't really seem to be um, generating uh, the signals that we measure. So we'd like to think a little bit more about packing geometries or how much disorder there happens to be, how large the extent of these boundaries really happens to be, to be able to figure out uh, how they might impact things like exciton migration in these materials. Okay, so on this side of the lab, um, I hope that I've been able to convince you uh, that taking this approach of uh, focusing down our laser spots so that we can look in individual regions of these films gives us a really clear picture of what's going on, what, what these exotons are doing uh, in these materials, uh, and that um, that's allowed us to reveal various different processes like the singlet fission and vibrational relaxation uh, and to unify the dynamics that we observe at different regions uh, in these films. Uh, we've just started looking at the fact that we have some access to information of what's going on specifically at the boundary, uh, and hopefully uh, by uh, learning from these sorts of studies, we'll be able to predict, uh, you know, what sort of morphologies of these films would be optimal uh, to make uh, organic photovoltaics or other electronics. Um, so there are other materials that we'd like to study that are even more disordered. Uh, and in order to do that, we think we're going to have to uh, reduce the spot size of our laser beams further. Um, and so we have a variety of different schemes that we're thinking of using uh, in order to do that. Uh, we've started thinking about using far-field super-resolution microscopy and adapting it to be time-resolved. Uh, we've also started thinking about using plasmonics uh, in order to be able to make very small uh, volumes for excitations. Okay, so um, that's the bulk of what I wanted to tell you. I guess I shouldn't say bulk, um, but that's the bulk of what I wanted to tell you uh, about the work that's going on um, uh, in, in the thing film photovoltaic side of the group. I did want to spend just a few minutes telling you a little bit more about this microscope that we'd like to be able to use uh, in order to ultimately look at uh, protein reorganizations in photosynthetic membranes. Okay. Uh, so this is something that really arose out of my sitting and staring at these different pictures of chloroplasts. Okay, so on the one hand, if you look at a TEM micrograph, uh, you can see these really beautiful granite stacks here, and there's a lot of structural detail, uh, but this uh, chloroplast has been sliced and diced and stained, and there are no dynamics going on inside. Okay, on, on the other hand, if you look at any one of these little diffraction-limited spots uh, in each of these four chloroplasts here, um, each spot is a granite stack, okay? Uh, and so there's a lot of dynamics going on inside of each of those spots, but we can't resolve it. 
OK, so I wanted to somehow blend the best of both worlds here. Was there some way to be able to capture the resolution that we have in these images and the non-invasiveness that we have in those images? Uh, and, and one way that you can do that um, is to use a scintillator. OK, so a scintillator is a material uh, that produces light when you hit it with electrons. And they're used in uh, the detectors of electron microscopes all the time. Uh, so our idea was, can we use the scintillator not for detection, but for illumination? Uh, and that process is called cathodoluminescence. Okay, so uh, we wanted to make uh, some sort of microscope that used this cathodoluminescent process. So imagine sticking a membrane uh, inside some aqueous environment here in this little liquid cell uh, and sticking it next to one of these scintillating materials that cathodoluminesces so that when you hit it with an electron beam, these electrons scatter around inside, and they generate excitons, actually. Uh, and by a process very similar to what we have in photosynthesis and in these uh, organic photovoltaic films, we want energy transfer to occur uh, between our, our scintillator uh, and uh, the fluorophores in our, uh, in our sample. And then we want to correlate the fluorescence that comes from those to the position of the electron beam. OK, so this is a way to make a a sort of near field scanning optical microscope that has no moving parts. Um, and I think it would be uh, a huge boon. Okay, and it's something that we could use not only to study uh, biological samples, but also maybe even the films uh, that I've just been telling you about. Okay, so we're interested in those sorts of materials and biological applications uh, in looking um, at the dynamics uh, of proteins in solution as well maybe also of electrolytes uh, near electrodes and batteries. Um, I think this could be very broad. Um, but let me tell you a little bit more about the critical component and about the progress that we've made in making this microscope. OK, so this is my team who works on this. They're the real critical components, so Dave and Connor and Craig and Jake and Hannah. Um, and um, the critical component that they've been trying to put together is really um, the scintillating film. So about at least a year's worth of work went into trying to figure out what to make and trying to make it. Okay, so um, this film uh, is an oxide. It's made of uh, yttrium aluminate doped with cerium ions uh, that Dave painstakingly grows by pulse laser deposition on a very fancy substrate that we get from Daryl Schlamm at Cornell. Uh, and in order to be able to make a microscope out of this, uh, we need to flip it over uh, and expose the second face. We need to etch away a bunch of silicon here in the substrate so that we can um, hit uh, one face with the electron beam uh, and stick our sample on the other side. Okay? Uh, so I want to show you some of the characteristics of these films and then also our first attempts to do a proof of concept imaging. Um, so these films are really beautiful. Okay? So we do a lot of characterization uh, of them. Uh, so these are all the sort of acronym characterizations that I was telling Cynthia and some of her group members about earlier. Uh, so um, these are very crystalline films, which is very important, it turns out, uh, to make them bright and robust to electron bombardment. Um, they're really nice and smooth, which is good if you want to stick membranes on them. Uh, and uh, they turn out to be pretty decent fret donors because they have this really nice uh, pure spectral peak here uh, in the blue region. Okay, uh, but it's not good enough for them to be bright and robust. Um, they also need to somehow have very high optical resolution when you excite them with an electron beam. Uh, and so that's something that Dave measured uh, by rastering an electron beam over a cleaved edge in one of our films. Um, and he takes two pictures, one where he just collects the electrons like you do in a typical electron microscope, and one where he collects the light that comes out too. And you can see that when he crosses this step um, he gets pretty nice resolution um, that's very nearly comparable in cathodoluminescence uh, as it is when you do uh, the measurement with the electrons coming out. Um, actually, he's gotten down to, I think, about 14 nanometers under some other conditions here. So we're pretty excited that this is really nanoscale. Okay? Um, so that's really great. Uh, Craig has taken these um, and patterned them, which we also think is cool. So he's been able to pattern the luminescence of the films without really removing that much material from them. Uh, and we can do that on a resolution that's really similar uh, to our uh, optical resolution. And we think this could be really useful if we wanted to illuminate materials with certain patterns, designer patterns, or even to do lithography. 
Um, but uh, all of these measurements that I've told you about uh, to characterize the films have really been done in this sort of geometry here. Um, and we need to have this sort of geometry uh, in order to do a proof of concept measurement. Okay, so that's what we've transitioned uh, to doing. Um, and we're getting close. Maybe we see a glimmer of something. Uh, so one thing that's really important um, is that we can ensure that these films will actually fret so that they actually exhibit energy transfer to an acceptor. So when we tether dyes like this, uh, this CPM die to the surface, uh, we can uh, deliberately, uh, progressively quench the dye in order to show that we can change uh, how much fret is actually going on between um, the donor, our scintillator, and the dye, our acceptor. Okay, so that's reassuring. Uh, and then if we move to this geometry that I mentioned where we expose uh, both uh, the scintillator face and also uh, put some sort of sample uh, here, so in this case a bunch of phosphors that are going to act as acceptors, um, then we can start doing a proof of concept measurement. So if Dave hovers his electron beam uh, over uh, one of these spots where we have one of these acceptors here, um, if he tunes the energy of the electrons uh, that he's using to hit uh, the scintillator, if he has a three kilovolt beam, um, then the electrons kind of scatter in this region, but they don't um, go that far into our scintillator. Um, if he increases that to about 4 kV, um, then uh, the electrons start penetrating into the scintillator. We don't want them to go any further, but we do want them to get far enough that we can get indirect excitation of this acceptor here. Okay, so this is very preliminary data, but exciting data no less. Um, so here um, is the light that comes out when Dave makes these measurements at these two voltages. And while um, it's possible that we see uh, an increase in the emission from the acceptor, this film was kind of thick, so you can see it kind of dominates right here. Um, but we do see that there's a quenching in the shape uh, on the left-hand side, on the blue side of our scintillator emission. And we think that that could be a signature um, that uh, we're having this fret process happen here. Okay, so we need to do a lot more work uh, in order to figure out if that's really uh, the case, but it's something that we've been able to do reproducibly and something that goes away if we go up to a higher voltage, like five kilovolts, where we directly excite uh, this thing here. Okay, uh, so this just says exactly what I did, but I hope that I've also convinced you that uh, you know there's some sort of bright future uh, for this new sort of imaging, that it would allow us uh, to look uh, at the nanoscale at dynamic processes uh, in systems like this photosynthetic membrane um, because we have this nice high spatial resolution, um, because we may have been able to prove that we can get this resonant energy transfer process to occur. Um, and uh, it would be really beautiful to be able to use it, not only uh, to look at uh, samples that are uh, encapsulated in aqueous environments, but maybe also uh, in the materials like the ones that I, I mentioned um, for the bulk of the talk. Okay, so uh, that's a little flavor for the work that we've been doing in my group in the past three years. Um, and um, this is the group. Okay, so I've tried to mention uh, all the guys in the group uh, as I went along, and they're really, uh, in my opinion, doing really wonderful work. It's great to be able to work with such talented and dedicated students and postdocs. And all the people in the smaller print over here are either uh, collaborators or people who let us into their labs in particular on the Berkeley campus in order to use their equipment and so forth. Uh, and so I'm also really grateful to them and to all of our funding sources. So thanks also to you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Questions for Naomi? Do we? So I have lots of questions, but I'll just ask one or two. So, um, <laughs> You just take the absorption step of a phenosine with your solid substance phenosine solution. Does mm -hmm. it have this absorption out of 700 nanometers, or is this a property of the fact that you've got molecular interactions in the film? Yeah, so it is. I, I'm I'm not sure I can dig it out. I can show you later, but I have a I have the two spectra plotted on the same axes at some point, so solution in solid state. And the general trend that you see is there's a big red shift. Uh, when, and broadening when you move to the solid state. Um, so the peak at 700 nanometers 
um, in solution, it's probably closer to like 600 or something like that. Um, so yeah. these different domains, then, do the different domains, will they differ then in their absorption spec motion, or is it just intensity because you've got more material path in? So we've actually done similar um, measurements to the nonlinear ones that I showed here, um, but with linear absorption as a function of wavelength. So basically we stole an old uh, UV vis um, monochromator and we can funnel uh, the light into our, our microscope and look domain by domain. Um, and uh, for example, the, the linear absorption spectrum, um, uh, so if, I, if this is wavelength, um, so if this is my 700 nanometer peak, there are a few other peaks here and here. Um, and we see the heights of those go up and down with respect to one another as we look in one domain versus another. And we've been doing a whole lot of analysis looking at, um, for example, what happens, uh, you know, like what are the correlations? So where for each of those different peaks um, do you get maximum absorption? At what polarization? Uh, and we see some general trends like uh, two of them are correlated and one of them is pretty much anti-correlated, but not always. Uh, and so we need to take things into account like the projection of the crystal structure onto, you know, our sample plane and things like that. Uh, but we're trying to get an idea like about how to statistically characterize the diversity of structures of these different domains based on those sorts of measurements too. <laughs> okay, so these are not doing any kind of charge separation. So these excitons are localized excitations because if you had an electron wandering off or a hole on them off, it still had the bleaching and maybe it has some real positive right. absorption. Yeah. So these must not be doing, you know, whatever your definition is, they're not, they're not charged excitons, right? They're not creating separation. Yeah, so um, I think you're right. So there is a little bit of a charge transfer character to the exciton, so far as we know. So um, we've been collaborating with Jeff Neaton and Sahar Sharusada uh, at the Molecular Foundry, and they, um, they've they done some preliminary calculations where when they try and visualize what the electron and hole look like and where, they're, where they are, um, that they're not entirely co-localized. They're both a little bit delocalized over a few different molecules, um, but we don't think that they separate further than that because like you say, we would just see a bleach that would go on forever. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. So the first part, what's the size of the solution um, when you are uh, analyzing the domain? Yeah, so the resolution we were using here uh, was about seven microns. Um, and it doesn't need to be, you can see from the size of the domains, it doesn't need to be any smaller than that in that case um, because the domains are large enough for us to fit our beams in. Um, so that's something we were actually really excited about in this case and one of the reasons that we wanted to start off by studying this material. But in principle, you can go all the way down to the diffraction limit um, and do exactly the same measurement. It would just be a lot more painstaking because you know, the volume gets down and so does the signal to noise ratio. <laughs> I have a question. Dude, <laughs> 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 so he's not going to let me get on the plane tonight. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the singlet fission. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, that, you can take one singlet state and, and fission it into two triplets at half the energy. Mm -hmm. How exact is that, is that energy? The energy, yeah. Have to be, so, uh, can you pick up or donate a little bit of thermal energy? I think so. So what we found in our model is different actually than what people have tried to do in bulk measurements here. So we found that in order to make everything work really nicely to fit our data, that the this doubly occupied triplet state was a tiny bit higher in energy than the singlet. Yeah. yeah, I mean it was kind of exaggerated on the schematic, but um, not that much higher, so within like KT, <laughs> and you know, we're not adding thermal effects into our kinetic model. Um, so for all intents and purposes, it's resonant. Um, and in many different pentacene and pentacene derivatives, people ha have seen evidence for singlet fission. Uh, and it depends a lot on the geometry of how the molecules pack. Um, so people have done studies on how efficient it is. Um, based on what the center to center distance is between the different molecules, which is going to affect um, exactly whether those energies are resonant. Uh, 
Um, and if you look at other sort of like series of polyacenes, so instead of pentacene, if you look at tetracene, um, there is some singlet fission in tetracene, even though um, you don't have a perfect resonance, uh, but not as much as you would have in, in pentacene and so forth. So you wouldn't expect to see that in isolated molecules in solution, is that right? Yeah, you know, that's right. You've only got one triplet state. Right, yeah. Popular. So these states, uh, even though they're, they're fairly localized, the, there's some delocalization um, over several molecules, say like five or seven or something like that. And so you need all of those to be there. You'd at least need a cluster in solution in order to see it. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Let's let the great guys. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Going through the feedback. What are the fate of those triplets? Do they do anything useful or do they have to go back to ground state via internal conversion? Um, so if, if you were hooking this up and, and trying to make a device, what you would hope is that the triplets, especially since they can kind of hide from the light field for quite a long time, um, like it takes a long time for phosphorescence to occur, um, that they would find their way, they would diffuse to an interface where you could still have enough of a thermodynamic driving uh, potential for charge separation. Um, and so in, in some of the work that I think I mentioned the Baldo group has done, they basically made solar cells of other materials and stuck um, layers of these different types of pentacenes on the surface so that they do the light absorbing and inject triplet excitons uh, into the solar cell, and they've been able to demonstrate external quantum efficiencies of like almost like 200 percent. I mean, the total efficiency of the device is still probably more like one, but um, but it you know it, it's a demonstration that this effect really does work. That the triplets really do get to where they need to go. Yeah. Okay. So, so they ask my question. So why <laughs> why are the triplet why are you seeing the bleaching thing going away at 250? Uh, so yeah, so the triplets, I think they can live a lot longer, and I guess suppose if they're there in high enough concentrations, they you can have the reverse process of this triplet annihilation. Um, so uh, we didn't build um, all of the diffusive processes into our model, and already we get a decent fit. So we could we could add all of that in as well. Um, so. One thing that I didn't mention is that in the model itself, we didn't build those processes. So the model should dictate that, you know, at infinite time, you know, like all of the signals should be zero, right? Uh, but when we fit our, our data just empirically to try exponentials, we also included an offset. And whether that offset um, is evidence that there is some sort of, you know, like leech that goes on for like a really long time, longer than we're measuring. Uh, because they're still triplets or because maybe they're, you know, free carriers or I, I doubt that they're free carriers, but um, it could be that that's the reason that there's an offset. It could also be that, you know, we measure out to close to a nanosecond and um, if the some of the internal conversion processes are even longer than that, then we might not be getting a very good measure of exactly what that uh, longer time component is. Yeah. I think we have a remote question. Yeah, so here was the question from John Lindsay at NC State. Uh -huh. He is asking you, what can you say about the distance and direction of exciton migration in the GIPS pentacene? Okay, um, so I don't know, um, I don't know yet how to answer the distance question, but that's something that we're working up to in terms of using these um, uh, super resolution sort of measurements. Uh, and, and making them time resolved. So that you'll have to check in with me later. Uh, but in terms of the direction, uh, I suspect that the direction is probably also the direction where we get uh, large hole mobilities or large delocalization uh, of the exciton. So that would be along the b-axis of the crystal or basically along the pi stacking direction. Yeah. Yeah. Are these room temperature measurements? Yeah, these are all room temperature. What, what would happen if you went to low temperature? Is that technically um, uh, too difficult? Yeah, because it's really hard to stick an objective that close to your <laughs> sample at low temperatures. So, I mean, you can, but whenever people ask me that and my students are in the room, they go, oh. <laughs> so, um, so we're not doing that now, um, but um, if you make these sorts of films and stick them in a cryostat and do linear absorption measurements, so you actually see the linear absorption spectrum change, it looks like 
um, rather than having this one band that's quite broad around 700 nanometers, you can see a little bit of Davidoff splitting. Um, so we think that at higher temperatures we get maybe dynamic localization that we don't have at lower temperatures. So it would be really interesting to see how different the dynamics were there. The other thing is that the, the sort of, well, I'm not an organic chemist, so for me, Tibbs pentathene just looks like a sort of snowman or scarecrow with these big arms, <laughs> right? Um, the arms are kind of, you know, parts of the arms at least are kind of floppy, and so you kind of have like a layer of these bricks and then a bunch of arms, and then another layer of these bricks, and so forth. So I think the whole structure is a little bit floppy. Um, and that may well play an important role in determining the optical properties as well. Okay, hey, any more questions? If not, let's thank Naomi for a very nice talk. I think it's time for lunch with the students.